Welcome to How Does Civic Participation Influence Health? County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is produced with Healthy Places by Design and is the result of the contributions of many colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I also want to acknowledge that the views of the speakers outside of the, uh, those in, within CHRNR are their own. Hi, my name is Erica Burroughs Girardi. I am a Senior Outreach Specialist at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And today I'm joined by colleagues who will assist in your learning experience. I want to start by introducing you to Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design. Hi, Joanne. Hi, Erica, and hi, everyone in the audience. So glad to be here. We're uh, really pleased to be co-producers of the CHRNR webinars with Healthy Places by Design. I did want to point out that my role during the webinar today will be to monitor the Q&A box. So as you all may have heard in the introductory video, please use the Q&A box for specific questions you have of our presenters. If we have time later on in the webinar, we will queue those questions up and get as many of them answered. I'm going to hand things over to Tommy Jaime right now, and Tommy with CHRNR is going to talk about the chat feature. Tommy? Thanks, Joanne. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here with you all. Um, I'll be chatting with you uh, in the chat box today, like Joanne said. And when chatting, please be sure to use the drop down box and choose chat to everyone before sending your message. This way, everyone can see your chat. And if you have a question, please be sure to place it in the Q&A box where Joanne will meet you. Um, and next up, I'd like to introduce Erin. Erin is, is a colleague at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, and she'll be helping uh, out with technology today. And if you have any technology issues during the webinar, please let us know in the chat and she'll be able to help you. Hi, Erin. Hi, Tommy. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today. So like Tommy said, if you're experiencing any technical problems or issues, please send a message to the host and panelist in chat and I'll see what I can do to help you. Now I will pass it back to Erica. Thank you so much, Erin. And uh, this is Erin's first day taking the lead in that technology role for our webinar. So Erin, welcome to the production team and thank you um, for all that you do for County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our two guests today. I wanna to start with Don Hunter. Don is the director of the Southeast Eastern region um, of the Network for Public Health Law. Don's organization is also a member of the Healthy Democracy, Healthy People Coalition. And we'll learn more about the coalition and the work that it does later in the webinar. Right now, please join me in welcoming Don. Hi, thanks Erica for the introduction. I'm glad to be here today. Thank you so much, Don. And Don literally just rolled off another webinar to join us. So we are definitely so pleased to have you. Um, thank you so much, Don. And I also want to introduce you to a dear friend of County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. Her name is Kim Irwin. And Kim is the Executive Director of Health by Design, which is located in Indianapolis. Kim is also the Administrator of the Indiana Public Health Association. So welcome, Kim. How are you? Good, doing well today. I echo Don's comments. Thank you so much for having us and thank you to all of the participants for joining as well. Well, uh, we certainly appreciate you. And so um, I wanna know, wanna let you know that our goal is to answer these questions today. What comprises civic participation? We're also gonna explore how does civic participation benefit your health? And how do communities benefit from greater civic participation? I know that there are a few of you in the audience today that are new to County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. So I do want you to know that we are committed to advancing equity and improving health outcomes. To accomplish our goals to, to actually do this, we start with in, um, inviting you to start with data to identify who isn't thriving. Then we point you to evidence to share what research is showing is working. We share guidance to help change makers take steps to action, like creating change. And lastly, we offer stories to give you inspirational examples of what community change looks like. CHRNR is a comprehensive program. 
Our goal is to provide you with tools and resources to move you from data to action so that in the end, everyone has the opportunity to thrive in your community, no matter what their zip code is, the color of their skin, their age, or any other aspect that makes us unique. So you can learn more about what it is that we do by watching our CHRNR 101 webinar on demand. And Tommy's chatting out a link uh, to that webinar right now. We will be sharing lots of good information with you today. I think the chances are you will want to unpack a lot about what we're talking about. And so I wanna invite you to join me with an interactive discussion group. This is a way that you can process what you're learning today. And was, the discussion group will be held right after the webinar. These conversations give you a chance to be face to face with other webinar attendees, share what you're doing locally and ask questions of other participants. Um, uh, we are pleased to offer these uh, sessions in partnership with Healthy Places by Design and Joanne will be our lead facilitator. I actually love these discussion groups because it's really uh, the best chance that I get to really interact with our audience and to hear what it is that you're doing. So Tam Tommy will be chatting out a link for you to join that discussion group later on in the webinar. Be sure to look out for it. Before we hear from our guest again, I wanna make sure that we have a shared understanding of the term civic participation. Like what exactly is civic participation? Well, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, civic participation is broadly defined as participation, participating in activities that advance the public good. Now these activities can include volunteering, service learning, participating in public meetings, and participating in the political process like voting or testifying at a city council meeting or other ways of being politically active. The question is, while civic participation may feel good, do any of these activities produce health benefits? Well, there are actually multiple studies that show that civic participation is linked to a variety of health benefits, a few of which I have listed here today. And this list came from healthypeople.gov. Additionally, Studies have found that when youth like these cute little, uh, these cute folks here are encouraged to volunteer, they're more likely to be civically engaged across their lifetime. So there are many ways that civic participation shows up. Today, we're gonna focus more on voting though. We will also discuss how you can build a civic infrastructure to create space for residents to engage. The question is, why do we want to create space for civic participation? Could it be that communities as a whole benefit when residents are more civically engaged? Well, Healthy Democracy, Healthy People Coalition has been asking that same question. So I wanna re-invite Dawn back to the mic as we explore this question in more detail. So welcome back, Dawn. And if you would, please introduce us to Healthy Democracy, Healthy People Coalition. I'd be glad to. The uh, Healthy Democracy, Healthy People was born out of two organizations, We Can Vote and Vote Safe Public Health in 2020, which was um, Vote Safe Public Health in particular was a coalition of 10 leading public health organizations that joined together to support efforts to ensure that all Americans could vote safely and stay healthy during the 2020 uh, election in a pandemic before we had vaccines. Um, after that election, we wanted to continue the work of assuring that everyone everywhere has an opportunity to participate in the electoral process in order to create healthy, inclusive communities and advance health equity. And recent events with Delta variant of COVID-19, along with continued barriers to voting and threats to public health and elections officials, I think are a good reminder that protecting and promoting our ability to participate safely in our communities and stay healthy should be paramount. Um, and lastly, and importantly, we also wanted to emphasize um, and want to continue to emphasize that voting and civic engagement benefit everyone. So the ability to participate in elections and other forms of civic engagement are signs of a healthy democracy. Yes, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how you all are building civic muscle. Yeah, so we build civic muscle as a way to support both a healthy democracy and healthy people. And we do that by organizing these three things. So we organize people 
um, and strengthen the capacity of communities by aligning efforts and strengthening relationships across organizations to promote access to the ballot for everyone. We organize resources by assuring that there are resources, policies, and processes in place to support civic and electoral system participation. You might also hear this called building civic infrastructure, and that's what you're going to hear Kim talk a little bit more about today. And the last piece of that is organizing narrative, knowledge, and data. And we do that to collectively promote the understanding of the relationship of health to civic engagement, inclusion, and social cohesion. And that's what the Health and Democracy Index is all about. Awesome. Why is civic participation important to our well being? Well, as part of the research um, on the idea of creating the Health and Democracy Index, which started out as a report card idea, we did a literature review. And we found that there is a strong relationship between civic participation, which is very often measured as voter turnout, and the health focus areas that you see here. And one of the most commonly referenced of those is self-rated health. And so self-rated health is how you rate your health either to people um, of the same age group or at a previous compared to a previous point in time. But it's really a good also um, population level health measure. It tells us a lot about the health of communities. And it's a, it's a measure that's used across the world. Um, yeah. Where communities have si higher self-rated health, they also have higher voter turnout. Uh, everything that's currently in the in index is based on this literature review that we conducted, and it's many of the health focus areas that you see here that all show a strong relationship between civic engagement, again, measured as voter turnout, um, and these health, uh, these health focus areas. And this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the more common associations that we found. Yeah, and, and if any of these focus areas look familiar, it's because these are very um, similar to the same focus areas that we have on county snapshots. So um, tell us what we're seeing here with this, uh, with these numbers. So what, when we first started thinking about what this index could look like, and again, we started out thinking it might be a scorecard or something like that. Um, what we did was we looked at the cost of voting index, and I'm going to explain to you what that means in a minute. But we looked at the cost of voting index, and then we looked at existing health data. So for all these different data points that you see here, uh, self-rated health, poor mental health days, poverty, infant mortality rate. And we looked at them um, by uh, averages. So the top 15 states, as you see here, perform better on average than the US average um, across all of these indicators. And then the bottom 15 states are worse on average across all of these indicators. And I don't know about how many data people are on this call today, but when you see something like this, it's, it should just be like, wow, this is amazing. And so we saw this and really the bottom line became, how do we tell the story behind the data? Because this is pretty powerful. Yeah, and it's pretty consistent too. Very consistent. So we started um, this project at the end of March of this year. We had a series of stakeholder meetings with both public health and elections experts. We also, in the process of developing the website that you will have the link to, um, we conducted end user testing and focus groups that were thanks to a partnership with the Center for Civic Design. We also had a planning group and research that met, um, the core planning group met regularly throughout the course of the project and we conducted research ongoing throughout the project and constantly kind of looking at um, what data were available to us um, and, and how best to present them. And uh, we did that also to help go through narrative, to answer questions that we had about the data and to respond to feedback that we were receiving. And why did the coalition create the Health and Democracy Index? And how is it helpful to those of us who are civic participation champions? Yeah, this is a great question. And as a result of the stakeholder groups, we articulated these goals that you see here on this screen. You'll have these slides available to you so you can read them. But what I want to emphasize is that the focus is on really how do we illustrate the connection between voting and health? We really believe that the index can serve as a, a critical tool in our work to strengthen civic and voter participation, in part by expanding public understanding of the connection between robust, inclusive democratic practices and healthy and resilient communities. So we really want to clearly explain the correlation between voting policy and health outcomes, and thereby really expand the narrative about voting, because there are lots of good reasons to vote, and one of them is your health and the health of our right. communities. So, um, and the last part of this is that we really want to ide identify practical points of intervention um, for people who are civic uh, participation champions and support the effort to strengthen access to the ballot. 
Yeah, and thanks for mentioning about the, the, the slides because we actually have placed a link um, so you can uh, download a copy of the slides while Dawn is uh, sharing her presentation. And I wanted to know, Dawn, if you would give us a brief tour of the tool. I love giving a tour of this tool. It's an amazing tool and it's just the product of a really great collaborative process. So the, um, when you land on the Health and Democracy Index, you, the default view you have is this graph here. And this is a plot of the cost of voting index versus overall health from America's health rankings. There are also 11 other metrics or health focus areas in addition to overall health that are included in the index. And you're gonna see that in a moment that you can change the graph. Um, but what you see here is a very clear correlation between better voting access and overall health in the top right quadrants. So overall health is a composite score that's calculated from all ranked measures for each state in America's health rankings, and we are using 2020 data. And then the cost of voting index is an index that was developed by political science researchers at Northern Illinois University. It was first published in 2016 that to analyze the relative cost of voting in presidential election cycles from 1996 to 2016, and then they updated their work for 2020. And the cost of voting refers to the time and effort associated with casting a vote, and it's intended to characterize the overall electoral climate in each state. So and, and another way of describing that is to what extent does a, a state embrace inclusivity in its electoral process versus restriction or exclusion? And so the index itself has nine key air, uh, components that are in two categories that are really important to us, registering to vote and casting your ballot. Yeah, and we're going to get dig into this in just a second. And I know all of you are excited to check out this tool. So I want you to know that a link to this um, index is highlighted in the webinar resource guide that's going to be emailed to you tomorrow. Don, I noticed that the data is limited to the state level. You were saying it's America's health rankings. Why is it not able to go a little bit lower than the state level? So there are a couple of important reasons. One is that we do have health data for counties, obviously. Um, and uh, what we don't have is quality, consistent electoral data across counties. So that makes it a little bit more challenging to do this kind yeah, of analysis. We need both. Right. Right. We need both. And we also are using this excellent cost of voting index, um, which currently exists at the state level. So we don't have a version of that that's been adapted to county level analysis. Um, well, thanks we, for sharing it. Yeah, we know that people are interested in county uh, comparisons. So that's something we definitely want to work on. But this is definitely a good start because we can figure out what's happening with, um, with our states. So um, let's talk about the, how, elector, how you support electoral participation. Yeah, so the biggest barrier to voting is registration. Uh, and there are other barriers that are related to being able to cast your ballot and the impact on your ability to be engaged um, and to, un to learn about the electoral process, to learn about um, options during your election cycle, et cetera. Uh, so some of the things you see here are a really important part of the process. Automatic voter registration, which exists in 20 states with two more states starting next year. Um, same day registration in 20 states and um, election day registration in 18 states. And then DC also has um, same day registration. Most states have some form of early voting, but there is significant variation across states. So it could be the weekend before up to 20 days before an election. So not consistent. Um, Pre-registration refers to being able to register before you turn 18. So some states have laws that allow you to register at 16 or 17. Um, and then ID laws, Less restrictive means that there's no additional requirement or burden placed on the voter to verify who they are for their ballot to be counted. So for example, here in Florida, the local elections board can do a signature match to verify your ballot. You don't have to do anything else because they already have your signature on file. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's a tie to voting and, and health outcomes. Tell us a little bit more about how the tool helps us find that out. Yeah, so this slide I hope makes it very clear when you're on the site, you can see and you can and you can play around with the data, but there's a very clear correlation between um, health and voting access in both directions. So the X axis is uh, voting access, um, worse on the left, better on the right. And then health is on the Y axis, better health at the top, worse health on the bottom. And so what you can see in the upper right quadrant is that states that have more voting access have better health outcomes. 
And then on the lower left, um, states that have worse uh, voting access have worse health outcomes. And of course, there are variations. And then, you know, you might, when you're on the site, you're going to see there's a little light purple box above the uh, text box there. That's New Hampshire. New Hampshire is really interesting <laughs> because um, it doesn't rake really well on the cost of voting, but they have some great health outcomes. But for the most part, mm. this trend is clear and consistent across the states. I know you all can't wait to figure out where your state lies on this. <laughs> so I, know I, I, was, I couldn't wait to look at Florida. Dawn and I both live in Florida. Okay, let's talk a little bit about voting policy and that connection with health. Yes, the takeaway message here is that voting is important for stronger public health outcomes and that vo voting and health create a reinforcing feedback loop. And what that means is that people who are healthy are more likely to vote. And that shapes policy that reflects the needs of those voters. And that policy supports the health and well being of those voters, leading to the continued likelihood of their engagement throughout their lifespan. So you heard Erica mention that, right? When you get engaged when you're young, you're more likely to be engaged when you're older. Right. That's true for voting. Um, the key piece here is the better health policy piece. So policy reflects the interests of the people who show up. So turning up to vote is critical for better health. You know, the one thing that I really like about this tool, Don, is that we have known, public health folks have known this for so long. Now we have the data to actually back up what we've, what we've known for so long. And there's, there's this interesting feature on the tool called the policy picker. So how does it work? This is my second favorite feature on the tool. Um, but people often ask, you know, what's the relationship between law and health? Like how, do, how does law affect health outcomes? So what you can see here are four categories of voting policies that are, have a significant impact um, or si significant association with health. So those are inclusive registration, which includes automatic same day and election day registration, which you just heard me mention. Um, vote at home, which is all mail elections or no excuse absentee voting. Restrictive voter ID, so these are states that require additional documentation at the polls even after you've already established your eligibility to vote. And then voting rights restoration, which means your rights are not lost or they are restored post-incarceration. So in some states, um, they're, not, they're not restored until completion of all terms of your sentence, and in some states you have some permanent loss of your rights. Um, for a felony conviction. And there are explanations under each of these boxes, but what you can mm -hmm. see is the same correlation exists. So this view here that you see right now is, um, is voting rights restoration. Mm -hmm. And you can clearly see that states that do not permanently disenfranchise voters after felony conviction have better health outcomes. And by the way, it's also good for the health of those individuals uh, to have their rights restored, right? They can have access to jobs, educational right. opportunities, licensure, et cetera. So really a critical policy. And then we see the inverse is true too. I mean, low voter participation leads to more disparities. Right, so you saw the reinforcing feedback loop already, and this is just a reminder that it works both ways. So voting disparities lead to health disparities, which lead to continued voting disparities. Uh, people who are in poor health are less likely to vote, and this leads to less inclusive policy, right, because it's just healthy people and uh, people with money and, and, and resources who show up to vote. Uh, that can lead to continued poor health, and then this occurs, again, across the lifespan. So policy, you know, as I said on the previous slide, is shaped by the people who turn up to vote. And there's very, there is some research to show that elected officials are more responsive to constituents who vote than those who don't. So on the site, you'll get the, an explanation of the connection with health disparities, but, but we do know that voting disparities and health disparities are very clearly linked. Yeah. And tell us about this, the health equity piece and how it fits into. Yeah, so one work. way that we, we can address health disparities is by addressing voting disparities. We know that certain communities who face more barriers to voting also face barriers to health equity. In public health, um, all the public health folks on this call will know that worse health outcomes are often associated with lower income and education levels. The same is true for voting. Turnout is lower for people with lower income and lower education levels. And we also know that there are variations by race and ethnicity, which you see here on this graph. Despite record turnout in 2020, only approximately one third of eligible Americans still did not cast a ballot. And historically, voter turnout is lower for Latino, Asian American, Pacific Island, Islander, and American Indian people, as well as for younger voters, voters with lower education levels, as I just mentioned, and lower income voters. Um, people experience barriers to registering to vote and casting a ballot for many reasons, including a lack of identification, 
frequent changes in address, limited English proficiency, um, misconceptions about the rights of people with disabilities to vote. And if any of these things sound familiar, it's because these are some of the same barriers to healthcare that people experience. Right. Um, and then the last thing I'll emphasize is that not being registered again is one of the main reasons that voters cite for failing to vote. Um, but you can see clearly here at the top line, um, white non-Hispanic white voters turn out at higher rates than all other racial and ethnic groups. And let's talk about um, another way that you can use this tool with those health fo focus areas. So you can look at how the plot changes for all of the health focus areas that we've included, and you see them here. Um, listed in the drop down on the right hand side uh, screen. So self rated health uh, as good or better, um, voter turnout, poor mental health days in the previous 30 days, adults receiving disability benefits, uninsured percentage, active uh, physicians per 100,000 population, infant and premature mortality rates, community and family safety rankings, poverty, the Gini index, which is a measure of income inequality, and overall health. So these can kind of broadly be thought of as individual population um, and other determinants, health focus areas. And in case you're wondering how they're defined, they are all described on the methods page. And that's a screenshot. Um, there's a screenshot of that later, so you'll know what to look yeah. for. Um, but you can sort the graph and you can watch the boxes move around for the states uh, as you change the health focus areas. So it's kind of fun. And then you can also look at specific states and see what's going on there. Yes. So we do have data for states. We do not have territories or freely associated states yet. Um, but the first view for every state looks like this. This example is Massachusetts. But what you'll see for each state on this default view is voter turnout, um, the cost of voting index ranking, and premature mortality ranking. Um, and that's an important, and we included that because it's an important indicator of population health. The basic question of can you keep your people alive? It's a good one to be able to answer that you can do that well. So uh, here you see Massachusetts is doing relatively well. So the second view that you get looks like this. And so when you click on a state, you'll actually go through to another page that has all of the health focus areas for each state, plus the primary metrics that I've mentioned, the cost of voting index ranking, the overall health ranking. It has the status of each of the four categories of voting policies that we talked about already, um, and measures of civic participation, including turnout and registration rates. And then um, again, all the health focus areas. So you can scroll through and see all of these on one page for each state. So each metric has the measure um, or health focus area. It has a scale that shows you low to high, where it falls um, low to high relative to other states. So um, we're not, it's not a, a value that's ranking them. It's saying, you know, here are the data, here's where they fall from the high and low points in, in this data set. Um, and it has a definition of the measure, which is important because you don't want to have to go looking for that information when you're looking at the number. So it's all in one place for you to see. Yeah. And like any good scientist, you all have included your methodology and limitations and where you got your data from. We did. It includes um, everything that I've been mentioning. So it has an explanation of the cost of voting index. It has definitions um, for all of the health focus areas, why they're important for public health. Uh, it has all of our data sources. So um, that will be familiar to folks on this call for sure. Um, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, CDC, the census, um, all of those are part uh, this, uh, of some of the data that we have here. It also has our yeah. limitations which is important. So one thing that we get asked a lot is, well, what's the causal mechanism? This is not showing causation, right? There is a very strong correlation. Lots more research is needed to establish causation. We do know that there are things that do impact turnout um, and social cohesion is one of those things. Um, so more research is needed. And then we don't have race and ethnicity data up yet. And that's partly complicated by the way that those data are collected and reported that varies significantly, not only across states, but also within states, there can be variation in those data. Right, um, and then we that consistency. Yeah, and then we might just have data gaps. So we recognize that, but it's also something that we're continuing to work on. We want to build and add to this. Um, we also have a key reference list and additional resources for people who want to do more reading. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you use a lot of the same data sources that we use for county health rankings and roadmaps. Now, I think you've already said what your second favorite feature was. I think this is one is your favorite. This, <laughs> yes. How did you know? This is my because favorite. Because you built it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, for this is an interactive data table that um, what you see here is it's flipping through views that you can do when you when you land on this table. So you can sort um, high to low or low to high for every single health focus area and for all the voting policies. So you can see how it's changing and it's basically like a heat map and it shows you from best to worst, worst to best. Um, and it's great because also if you hover over each of the focus areas, it will give you a definition. So again, you don't have to go look for that definition on another page. Um, you can also hyperlink to your states, so you'll see that they each have underlines. That's because they are linked. So if you are looking at this heat map and you want to learn more about a state, you can just click on it. It'll take you to that state page. Um, but it's really just a cool way to visualize the data. It, it really is. And um, I certainly appreciate that wonderful tour of the index. Again, I know you all can't wait to dig your hands into it, and you will. You will be able to do that. But um, tell us what the next steps are for the tool. So I mentioned um, that we want more data, right? So we want to do breakdown by other population characteristics, including race and ethnicity. We've, got, we've gotten some suggestions about other social determinants of health, county level data, also looking at other indices that may be valuable and we're not sure and necessarily how they relate, but we certainly can look at them. And that's like the social vulnerabil vulnerability index uh, and the area deprivation index, things like that. Um, we also want to build on ways to take action and use the data for advocacy. So one important example is offering voter registration through state Medicaid offices. So folks on here may be familiar with Medicaid program. You may also be familiar with automatic voter registration through your state's Department of Motor Vehicles. So as part of you getting a driver's license or a state issued ID, you're providing proof of your identity and residency documents that prove your ability to register to vote. And so that's a part of a lot of state um, DMVs uh, across the US. Well, Fun fact, the same thing can occur at state Medicaid offices, which um, as part of the National Voter Registration Act already have to offer voter registration forms and assistance. So this is important because it can reduce disparities um, because Medi Medicaid beneficiaries are often also the people who are most likely to be left off right. of voter rolls. So people with lower incomes, people with disabilities, new voters, transient voters, and people of color. I mean, um, and what an efficient way to just increase access. I mean, that's, that's right. like a no brainer. And yeah. it's an easy way. People often have questions like how secure are our elections and how secure is our information? Well, you already have to go through a pretty extensive process to get approved for Medicaid benefits. And so, and those are um, redetermined typically on an annual basis. So it's also a really good way to keep the voter roll current. Exactly. So what is the take home message revealed by the tool and how do you want communities to respond to that take home message? You know, after, you know, we've talked to several times now, um, I want to, you know, I, I want to start by saying I think one of the most important things that you can do as a community member is to get out and be involved in your communities. So I saw a question in the chat earlier, like what other things can we do besides voting, there's lots of stuff that you can do. So do something, take care of people in your communities, build social cohesion, create more inclusive and healthy democracy by getting out and being involved. Um, but I also think that it's important to emphasize this quote that you see here. Dr. Benjamin moderated a panel for us when we launched the index, and he said this, voting is basically the ball game. It's the most important public health intervention that any of us can do. And I think it's really important, and what I would say in closing is really to emphasize that closing the voter participation gap is a public health imperative because reducing the voting disparities can reduce health disparities and create conditions where every single one of us has the opportunity to thrive. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. And um, stick around if we have time for um, questions and answers. Questions and answers. So we have time for questions. We certainly would like you to answer them, not me. But um, <laughs> even, if, even if we don't get around to that, um, so uh, those of you who are able to join us for the discussion group after the webinar, please do because Dawn will be there. And so you can, uh, we can ask her additional questions that we might have about this tool. But the Democracy and Health Index really helps to make it clear that there's that strong correlation between civic participation, particularly voting and health equity. So, you know, now we want to think about how do we create environments where residents are encouraged to be civically active? And that's where that civic infrastructure piece comes in. And Health by Design has actually been working to create opportunities for civic engagement across several communities in Indiana. And with that, I want to welcome back Kim Irwin. So Kim, can you please first introduce us to Health by Design? Sure. Hi, Erica. 
Thank you. So yes, Health by Design is a coalition model. We work at the intersection of the built environment and public health. We collaborate across sectors and disciplines to ensure that neighborhoods, public spaces, and transportation infrastructure promote active living for all. Um, we do work across the state of Indiana and sometimes beyond, and we just celebrated our 15th anniversary last month. Wonderful. Yeah. So the work that we do is grounded in the social ecological model, and we pursue policy systems and environmental change strategies um, intended to create healthier communities. We are also committed to centering health equity within our organizational practices and in our community-based initiatives. And so we are on the never-ending journey of becoming an anti-racist organization and helping to dismantle systemic injustices. Our core program and policy goals are to increase equitable, safe, accessible, convenient, and connected options for walking, biking, and public transit. And with that, we encourage responsible land uses. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, you see in that box um, sort of how we go about achieving our goals. We do that by convening partners and facilitating dialogue, by providing education, training, and technical assistance, by building capacity, advocating for policy change and promoting smart design. Yeah, you you are some busy folks there <laughs> in Indiana. How has your coalition's approach to this work changed over time? Yes, absolutely. And, and I do want to be clear that our that approach has changed over time. So building on decades of effort through the healthy communities movement generally and through our own experiences, we have learned that what that what we do, see, that how we do things is as, as important as what we do. Absolutely. And so, yep, I'm gonna repeat that again since I mumbled it. How we do things is as important as what we do. And I like to use this image of DNA as a nice analogy for that with the double helix of the two interconnected strands that wind around each other as a twisted ladder. Both strands, the what and the how, they're both required for our collective growth, our collective advancement and sustained excellence, just as in life itself. So over the years, we have been involved in numerous policy efforts and initiatives, mobilizing residents for community change that improves health. We played a key role in um, securing state enabling legislation that allowed Indianapolis and Marion County to have a transit referendum in 2016 in which voters successfully um, passed that, approving funding for three bus, of re bus rapid transit lines that are in development now. One is operating, two others in development. We conducted um, 46 active living workshops across the state, which you're going to hear more about later. And then we've had a number of efforts related to walkability and pedestrian safety, working directly with residents and neighborhoods and what we call our community champion um, and community champion initiative and working with community hubs. So there have been several significant lessons from these initiatives and others. And as a result, again, that work has evolved over time. So part of it, and this is, is key, is that we must accept that this work in healthy communities um, specifically and public health generally is inherently political. It is. <laughs> That is not to say though that it is partisan or must be partisan. And that's such right. an important piece. Yes. Our focus has also shifted over time to more direct engagement with residents and community members as opposed to working directly with um, like civil servants and elected officials and that kind of thing. So we're helping to support system navigation and trying to demystify the decision-making process around, you know, where roadway improvements are made or how um, food access spots are, are determined, where transit goes and that kind of thing. We're organizing people and building alliances and we're helping to develop advocacy know-how, skills and experience that can then be applied. So one of the things we've looked to is the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions and a framework they have around building civic infrastructure. And so to be very clear, from that definition of civic infrastructure, the purpose is to maximize participation in public problem solving. Yeah. Again, maximize well, participation in public problem solving. Right, and, and, and while voting is part of that, it doesn't, as you're showing, 
voting is not the only thing. You're also a actually making space for people to learn about systems and how they work and how to navigate those systems. But here you literally are talking about what creates or what are parts, those components of civic infrastructure. So what does it mean for Health by Design to like focus on developing a civic infrastructure? Yeah, absolutely. So again, as we've looked at the evidence and the lessons of others, and we've integrated our own findings and experiences over this past 15 years, we have come to focus on these five aspects of community change that are listed here. Shifting of social norms, strengthening the base of support, increasing organizational and community capacity, building alliances or partnerships generally, and then adding in and improving policy systems or environmental changes. So we've also been needed to approach the work differently. So authentic civic engagement, as most all of you know and, and do in your day-to-day -day work, it really requires centering relationships, putting relationships first. Many of you have likely heard the phrase moving at the speed of trust, um, but it is so critical to just keep that in mind and, and to again, really center that attitude and approach in what we're doing. The other thing about this is that it requires that we prioritize processes rather than specific outcomes. So again, how we do this work, the way we approach this work, the way people are engaged, it matters. It matters tremendously as opposed to just saying, yes, we got a complete streets policy kind of thing. And yeah, so again, that. yeah, it takes so much more time to do that. And it really requires potentially a change to our role, particularly when we think of ourselves as public health professionals and planning professionals and sort of the experts in this. So um, again, approaching it has needed to change. And then again, identifying measures of success that are meaningful to the community, which again, may be different than what we as, you know, paid professionals working for a nonprofit organization think are the measures of success. Yeah. So I wanted to highlight the active living program a bit more. Again, it has informed much of this civic infrastructure work and sort of led to this journey for us in, in building on that. So again, the program was conducted over a period of five years. It was funded um, through Centers for Disease Control and Prevention funding um, through our State Department of Health. And then we worked with Purdue Extension as well um, through their SNAP Ed program. We worked with each community for more than a year following the general process outlined on this slide. So I won't read that off, but you can see more about that there. And through those workshops and that work across the state, 46 communities, since then we have achieved dozens of local policy systems and environmental changes as a direct result of that. And we continue seeing those year over years and year over year and expect to into the foreseeable future based again on sort of the, the civic infrastructure developed through the process. So Assembly the program, part. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. We are sharing a link to the Active Living Guidebook and the resource guide you'll get tomorrow that is available and has more information. I'm certainly happy to chat offline with folks about that. Um, but we then, again, are using the lessons of that to guide much of our other local efforts and are beginning a new phase of the work here yet this fall. Yeah, I just wanted to add, it's, it's um, this, it, you know, I know you say you have a one-year success story, success story as part of this plan, but this in itself is a success story because you showed how creating this civic infrastructure has really worked in getting people involved. And now you have more health supporting policies um, in communities. So it's, it works. That's right. Yeah. Just kind of feeds into. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> just literally yesterday, anecdotally heard um, of a newspaper article that referenced health by design, hearkening back to a workshop that was like three or four years ago. And there's a street reconstruction project happening now um, that came from that discussion. And so those are the stories that, you know, really, you know, are, are bearing fruit from the seeds that were planted. And thanks for sharing that. You, um, that's literally breaking news. I, I, I know. Of course, I'm hearing <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> so, um, no, congratulations on that. I think it also shows that you, this work that you've done, plant seeds. So things you said it was like three, maybe three or four years ago. Yeah. These are seeds that are being planted and look what's happening as a result that even years later, 
things are happening and changes are being made and that um, these healthful policies are being implemented because you've made space for people to get civically engaged. And which really does lead into my next question, which is what has happened as a result of the mm -hmm. civic infrastructure work? Yeah, exactly. So again, in addition to us thinking about this work differently, approaching it differently and operating differently, we really have to, again, think about, um, think about outputs, outcomes, and impact a bit differently. So yes, again, we want to count complete streets policies. We want to understand how many schools are engaged in safe rest to school initiatives, but we also need to be evaluating what it means to build capacity, what it means to shift social norms, and to begin putting those data points and measures sort of more broadly and collectively into um, evaluation of the work that we're doing and what that means. And I will just say that, again, we recognize that those shifts, we've experienced that those shifts can be at odds with the priorities and the expectations of funders, of decision makers, and even other partners. Um, this is complex and long-term work, and it is often very messy. And, you know, I, I think it's important to name that here. And while we certainly don't want to be discouraging in saying it, it's part of the reality of doing this type of work and then figuring out how to support each other in it as well. Yeah. So I'll just close this slide with saying that that focus on civic infrastructure has also enabled a broader recognition and conversation around social determinants of health and the need to shift efforts upstream generally. When you're talking about these infrastructure components, you know, it, they of course apply broadly then, not just to built environment initiatives. And so then it's also sort of helped to facilitate or kind of um, brought forth conversations around equity and the legacy of racism and other forms of oppression um, related to civic engagement and, and participation. Yeah, so, um, and thank you for being honest about the challenges <laughs> that we need to be prepared to face. But key, also key with that, is building those relationships because that helps to mitigate some of the challenges that, that folks might encounter. Why should communities develop an infrastructure in their community, a civic infrastructure in their community? Yes, absolutely. So I think all of the reasons Don mentioned, right, are of course there. Um, but I would then assert that this civic infrastructure is really the foundation, not just of a healthy democracy, but that it's required for the community change that most all of us here in public health again, planning community development and allied fields are seeking to facilitate. We can't, we can't get what we're trying to get outcome-wise without this component. And so systems change like this, it, it is fundamentally systems change. It requires us understanding that system as it is, the interconnections of the various parts of that, and then how and where change can be influenced. And again, this civic infrastructure then facilitates a systems approach and goes back to that maximizing participation in public problem solving. What do we need to fix? How do we get there? And bringing as many voices to the table in that. Because we know that everyone, every age, every ability, every income, every race and ethnicity, whether we're paid professionals or we do this as you know, resident volunteers, like we can make contributions. And that the value of that diversity and those varied perspectives is, is critical again to, the, to these outcomes. So ultimately, I just I like to um, often use this intention slide in our talks. I heard someone say it once, and it's so important. There is such inertia around the status quo, right? The easiest thing to keep doing is what we're already doing. And so, and because it is complex and messy and long term, it, it it's easy or it's easy to default to what we're already doing because there's a path forward. And so I just again want to encourage the audience, but also in the context of the civic infrastructure, just really, um, again, uh, focus in saying that we all have fears of influence and bringing community voices into that community led efforts, community engaged efforts, sets forth our strongest opportunities for true, authentic community change. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. I certainly appreciate you um, just sharing your wisdom um, in this conversation. And I want to let the audience know, well, I actually want to ask you, I don't know if you know this, but did you know that you have the option to learn more about your community's health by 
overlaying congressional districts on top of your county health rankings. You can do this either with your rankings for your health outcomes or the rankings with the health factors. All you need is your um, state map. So all you need to do is go to your state page and do that overlay. And that overlay can be used to see how health differs within your congressional districts. Many congressional districts have both high and low ranking counties. And you can see this um, with my congressional district. Um, St. John's uh, County is the number, uh, is the highest ranking county in terms of health outcomes in the state of Florida. And I'm in Volusia County, which ranks um, number uh, 40. But this tool can be used for you to share with your representative or other residents within your congressional district in order to um, identify those geographic disparities or to determine where you want to build a civic infrastructure like Kim just described. So contact us if you'd like guidance on how to use this tool. So again, I wanna thank Don and Kim, and I'm actually curious if your understanding of how civic participation can influence health may have changed. I'm gonna ask Erin to share a poll right now. And would you be willing to let us know if your understanding of how civic participation can influence health has significantly improved, moderately improved, uh, not improved at all, or maybe a little improved. Your response is anonymous. We're not sharing this poll with the audience and we're not a, we have no way to tie it to your, um, your name. We just really wanna know how we did with this conversation. So Aaron, if you'll just leave that up just for another second and then you can close it. Thank you so much for participating. Um, Joanne, I think we have time for one question. I know it's hard to choose one. Can you choose one question? Just one, Erica. All right. Well, I just want to <laughs> thank folks for being so engaged. This webinar obviously got people thinking, um, and I did encourage several people who took the time to post questions in the box to come to the discussion group, because I know we don't have time to really unpack things, so please join us. Um, but the one question, if I have have to choose one is for Dawn. Um, and it was about, does data consider the impact of civic trust social ties on voter participation, which can also affect health outcomes? Does trust in elected officials or lack of trust impact voter apathy and poor health? So the one um, short answer I will say is that yes, social cohesion is a critical part of the conversation. So um, when, we, when we think about causation and needing to learn more, there is some um, research out there that shows um, that greater social cohesion um, results in uh, sh sh stronger voter turnout in healthier communities, right? It also results in lower mortality rates, um, higher life expectancy. And so that, that is an important part of the conversation. Certainly, um, I think there is also some additional research showing how um, individual voter trust affects turnout. Um, and certainly that's something that has um, been a more prolific question during this current election cycle, uh, or the, the most recent election cycle, and will continue to be going forward. And so more research is needed in that area. Um, but there are some great data sources that look at social cohesion and um, California in particular has some great research on um, surveys on um, neighborhood cohesion associated with voter turnout and civic participation as part of their um, health information survey that they do in the state. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I know Erica, that was my one question, but again, I know there are folks who wanna tap Don's brain and Kim's brain. Um, so again, folks, join us in the post webinar discussion group if you can, love to see you there. Thank you so much, Joanne. I know you're headed over there now, so I appreciate that. And I will see you shortly in the discussion group. I would also venture to say, I bet a lot of that social cohesion happens when people are more civically engaged. Is that true, Don? Oh, you're muted. I am muted. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. right, it's reinforcing. So if you're more right. engaged, you have greater social cohesion. And so this is why civic infrastructure is so important. I think Kim could speak to that as well. But it's like having public libraries and public transportation, um, safe spaces in your communities to get together and to engage in activities safely. Um, those are all things that are good for your health and good for the health of your community. And they build uh, more co cohesion within your neighborhoods. Um, and those ultimately have kind of rippling effects throughout the community right. in terms of well-being. Right, yeah. Um, so anyway, plan to come to 
please do plan to come to the discussion groups. I really actually want to unpack some more of this stuff with our speakers. And um, I would love for you to be able to share your thoughts on today's webinar. Tommy is sharing a link to a brief evaluation in the chat right now. And it would be terrific if you could click on the link and then complete the survey after the webinar or after the discussion group. But we do look at your feedback closely and we use it to improve our webinars. And I will also let you know, it's one of the ways that we determine what topics we wanna to bring to our audience. We actually do listen to what folks share with us in our um, feedback surveys and also in our registration questions. So please make sure you um, do that. We do appreciate that. One of the things we've been hear hearing from our audience is that you want to know how to connect with youth. And I wanna ask you this question. Do you realize that youth can change the world? I mean, who said that they wouldn't? You would never hear me say that they can't change the world. I want you to join me next month where I'm going to chat with two amazing young adults as they share what it takes to empower, empower youth to create change. Kevin Martin is a teacher and he's also in graduate school and he's the co-founder of an organization confronting racial inequities in the Mississippi Delta. Celine Bernhardt Lanier, get this, is a senior in high school and the CEO of an international organization, Rethinking Social Media um, Use Among Teens. And Celine li li lives in Spain and will be joining us next month to talk about her work with this international organization. So please sign up for that, reg uh, that webinar. Registration opened up just this morning for that webinar. And if you're going to be attending APHA 2021 in Denver at the end of the week, come see me. I would love to be able to meet um, those of you who come to uh, see our webinars every month. And I will be uh, staffing this County Health Rankings and Roadmaps booth. We'll be at booth 417. So please make sure you come and visit us. We will also be attending APHA virtually. So either way, come check us out. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Twitter, but also be sure to sign up for our newsletter. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars and our latest tools and resources. And as we wrap up for today's webinar, I wanna again invite you to join us for that discussion group where we can explore this topic and engage in conversations with all of you. These conversations give you the chance to be face-to-face -face with other webinar attendees and I'm looking forward to hearing what you are doing in your communities to build civic infrastructure and to encourage people to engage. So Tommy is going to send a chat out right now to, uh, for you to join that discussion group. When you click on it, you'll just need to complete a couple of questions and then you'll receive another link to be connected to the discussion group. So with that, I want to thank uh, Kim and Don. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. I want to thank my colleagues at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. And Erin, you did a wonderful job. And to those of you who um, are working so hard to advance equity in your communities, thank you so much for all the work that you do. I'll see you in the discussion group, and I'll see you next month. Have a good afternoon. <music>